Hey there, book enthusiasts. Welcome back to Mindful Audio Library. Today, we're delving into a little treasure that packs a punch in the world of finance, the little book that still beats the market. Introduction This book was originally inspired by my desire to give each of my five children a gift. I figured if I could teach them how to make money for themselves, then I would be giving them a great gift, truly one that would keep giving. I also figured that if I could explain how to make money in terms that even my kids could understand, the ones already in 6th and 8th grades, anyway, then I could pretty much teach anyone how to be a successful stock market investor. While the concepts covered in this book may seem simple, perhaps too simple for sophisticated investors, each step along the way is there for a reason. Stay with it, and I assure you the payoff for both beginning and experienced investors will be huge. After more than 25 years of investing professionally and after 9 years of teaching at an Ivy League business school, I am convinced of at least two things, one, if you really want to beat the market, most professionals and academics can't help you, and two, that leaves only one real alternative, you must do it yourself. Luckily, that might not be such a bad thing. As improbable as it may seem, you can learn to beat the market. Through a simple, step-by-step -step process, this book can teach you how. To help you along, I have included a magic formula. The formula is simple, it makes perfect sense, and with it, you can beat the market, the professionals, and the academics by a wide margin. And you can do it with low risk. The formula has worked for many years and will continue to work even after everyone knows it. Although the formula is easy to use and will not take much of your time, it will work for you only if you make the effort to fully understand why it works. Along the way, you will learn how to view the stock market why success eludes almost all individual and professional investors, how to find good companies at bargain prices, how you can beat the market all by yourself, 18. Introduction I have included an appendix section for those of you with a higher level of financial training but it is not necessary for people to read or understand the appendixes to be able to understand and apply the methods found in this book. The truth is that you don't need an MBA to beat the market. Knowing lots of sophisticated formulas or financial terms isn't what makes the difference. Understanding the simple concepts in this book is. So please enjoy this gift. May the small investment of time, and 20 bucks or so, greatly enrich your future. Good luck. Chapter 1. Jason's in the sixth grade, and he's making a fortune. My son and I see him almost every day on the way to school. There's Jason in the back of his chauffeur-driven limousine, all decked out in cool clothes and dark sunglasses. Ah, uh, to be eleven years old, rich, and cool. Now that's the life. Okay, maybe I'm getting a little carried away. I mean, it's not really a limousine, it's kind of a scooter. And the cool clothes and sunglasses part, well, that's not really true either. It's more like his belly hanging over a pair of jeans, no sunglasses, and what he had for breakfast still stuck to his face. But that's not my point. Jason's in business. It's a simple business, but it works. Jason buys gum, four or five packs a day. It's 25 cents for a pack and five sticks of gum to a package. According to my son, once in school, Jason transforms himself into a superhero of sorts. Neither rain nor sleet nor evil hall monitors can keep Jason from selling his gum. I guess his customers like buying from a superhero, or maybe they're just stuck in school, but however he does it, Jason sells each stick of gum for 25 cents. Supposedly. I've never actually seen it myself. Jason kind of shoves an open pack of gum into a potential customer's face and repeats, you want some, you know you want some. Until his fellow student either collapses or forks over a quarter. The way my son has it figured, that's five sticks at 25 cents each, so Jason rakes in $1.25 for each pack he sells. At a cost of 25 cents per pack, that means Jason is making one dollar of pure profit on every pack he can shove, I mean, sell. At four or five packs a day, that's a lot of money. So after one of our daily Jason sightings, I asked my sixth grader, gee, how much do you think this guy Jason can make by the end of high school? 
My son, we'll call him Ben, even though his real name is Matt, started whizzing through the calculations using all his brain power and a few fingers. Let's see, he replied. That's, say, four bucks a day, times five days a week. So, $20 a week, 36 weeks of school, that's $720 a year. If he has six years, two, J-O-E-L-G-R-E-E-N-B lat T left until he graduates, that's somewhere over $4,000 more he'll make by the end of high school. Not wanting to miss an opportunity to teach, I asked, Ben, if Jason offered to sell you half of his business, how much would you pay? In other words, he'll share half his profits from the gum business with you over the six years until he graduates, but he wants you to give him money now. How much would you give him? Well, I could see Ben's wheels start to turn now that there might be some real money on the line, maybe Jason doesn't sell four or five packs a day, but three packs, that's a pretty safe bet. So maybe he makes three bucks a day. That's still $15 in a five-day school week. So, 36 weeks in a school year, that's 36 times 15, I might have helped a little in here, that's over $500 a year. Jason has six more years of school, so six times $500 is $3,000 by the time he graduates. Okay, I said, so I guess you pay Jason $1,500 for half of those profits, right? No way, Ben answered quickly. First, why should I pay $1,500 to get back $1,500? That doesn't make any sense. Besides, the $1,500 I get from Jason will take six years to collect. Why would I give him $1,500 now to get back $1,500 over six years? Also, maybe Jason does a little better than I figure and I get more than $1,500, but he could do worse, too. Yeah, I chimed in, maybe other kids start to sell gum in school, and Jason has so much competition he can't sell as much. Nah, Jason's practically a superhero, Ben says. I don't think anyone can sell as well as Jason, so I'm not too worried about that. So I see your point, I responded. Jason's got a good business, but $1,500 is too much to pay for half. But what if Jason offered you half his business for $1? Would you buy it then? Of course, Ben shot back with a, Dad, you're being an idiot, kind of tone. So, fine, I said, ignoring the tone for a moment. The right price is somewhere between $1 and $1,500. Now we're getting closer but how much would you pay? 450 bucks. That's how much I'd pay today. If I collected $1,500 over the next six years, I think that would be a good deal, Ben said, evidently pleased with his decision. Great! I responded. Now you finally understand what I do for a living. Dad, what the heck are you talking about? Now I'm totally lost. I've never seen any gum. No, Ben, I don't sell gum. I spend my time figuring out what businesses are worth, just like we did with, for, J-O-E-L-G-R-E-E-N-B lat T Jason's business. If I can buy a business for a lot less than I think it's worth, I buy it. Wait a second, blurted out Ben. That sounds too easy. If a business is worth $1,000, why would anyone sell it to you for $500? Well, as it turned out, Ben's seemingly reasonable and obvious question was actually the magic question that got this whole project started. I told Ben that he had just asked a great question, that believe it or not, there is a place where they sell businesses at half price all the time. I told him that I could teach him where to look and how to buy those bargains for himself. But, of course, I told him there was a catch. The catch isn't that the answer is incredibly complicated. It's not. The catch isn't that you have to be some kind of genius or super spy to find $1,000 bills selling for $500. You don't. In fact, I decided to write this book so that Ben and his siblings could not only understand what I do for a living, but also so that they could learn how to start finding these bargain investments for themselves. I figure whatever career they choose in the future, 
even if it's not money management, a career I'm not necessarily encouraging, they'll definitely need to learn how to invest some of their earnings. But, like I told Ben, there is a catch. The catch is that you have to listen to a long story, you have to take the time to understand the story, and most important, you have to. The little book that beats the Mark A.T. Actually believe that the story is true. In fact, the story even concludes with a magic formula that can make you rich over time. I kid you not. Unfortunately, if you don't believe the magic formula will make you rich, it won't. On the other hand, if you believe the story I'm going to tell you, I mean really, truly believe, then you can choose to make money with or without the formula. The formula will take significantly less time and effort than doing the work yourself and will provide better results for most people, but you can decide which way to go when you're done reading. Okay, I know what you're thinking. What's this belief stuff about? Are we talking about a new religion, maybe something to do with Peter Pan or the Wizard of Ounce? I won't even bring up the witch inside the crystal ball thing that still scares the heck out of me, or the flying monkeys, mainly because neither has anything to do with my story. And what about the getting rich part, what's that? Can a book really teach you how to get rich? That doesn't make sense. If it could, everyone would be rich. That's especially true for a book that claims to have a magic formula. If everyone knows the magic formula and everyone can't be rich, pretty soon the formula will have to stop working. But I told you this was a long story. I'm going to start from the very beginning. For my kids and most others, almost all of this stuff will be new. For adults, even if they, six, j-o-e-l-g-r-e-e-n-b lat t think they know a lot about investing already. Even if they've been to graduate business school, and even if they manage other people's money professionally, most have learned it wrong. And they've learned it wrong from the beginning. Very few people really believe the story I'm going to tell. I know this because if they did, if they really, truly did, there would be a lot more successful investors out there. There aren't. I believe I can teach you, and each of my children, to be one of them. So let's get started. Chapter 2. Actually, just getting started is a big deal. It takes a great amount of discipline to save any money. After all, no matter how much money you earn or receive from others, it's simply much easier and more immediately rewarding to find something to spend it on. When I was young, I decided that all my money should go to Johnson Smith. Of course, I'd love to tell you that Johnson Smith was an orphan who just needed a little help. I'd love to tell you that the money given to Johnson Smith helped change his life. I'd love to tell you that, but it wouldn't be completely accurate. You see, Johnson Smith was a company. Not just any company, either. It was a company that sold whoopee cushions, itching powder, and imitation dog vomit through the mail. I mean, I didn't completely throw away all my money. I did buy some educational stuff, too. Once, the guys at Johnson Smith were able to sell me a weather balloon that was 10 feet tall and 30 feet around. I'm not sure what a giant balloon had to do with the weather, but it sounded educational, sort of. Anyway, after my brother and I finally figured out how to blow it up by somehow reversing the airflow on the vacuum cleaner, we ran into a big problem. The 10-foot balloon was quite a bit larger than our front door. Using a complicated formula that not even Einstein could fully comprehend, we decided that if we turned our backs and pushed really hard, the giant balloon could be squeezed out without bursting the balloon or damaging the door, and besides, our mother wasn't home yet. And it worked, except we forgot one thing. It seems that the air outside was colder than the air inside our house. That meant that we had filled our balloon with warm air. And since, as everyone except apparently me and my brother knew, hot air rises, the balloon started to float away. The two of us were left chasing a giant balloon down the street for about half a mile before it finally popped on a tree. Luckily, I learned a valuable lesson from the whole experience. Although I don't exactly remember what that was, I'm pretty sure it had something to do with the importance of saving money for things that you might want or need in the future rather than wasting money buying giant weather balloons that you get to chase down the block for all of three or four minutes. 
but for our purposes, let's assume that we can all agree that it is important to save money for the future. Let's also assume that you have been able to resist the many temptations of the Johnson Smith people, and the thousands of other places calling out for your money, that you, or your parents, have been able to provide for all of the necessities of life, including food, clothing, and shelter and that by being careful about how much you spend, you have somehow been able to put aside at least a small amount of money. Your challenge is to put that money, let's say $1,000, someplace where it can grow to be even more money. Sounds simple enough. Sure, you can just put it under your mattress or in your piggy bank, but when you come to get it, even years later, you'll still be left with the same $1,000 you put there in the first place. It won't grow at all. In fact, if the prices of the things you were going to buy with that money go up during the time your money was just sitting there, and therefore your $1,000 will buy less stuff than it used to, your money will actually be worth less than it was worth the day you put it away. In short, the mattress plan kind of stinks. Plan B has got to be better. And it is. Just take that $1,000 over to the bank. Not only will the bank agree to hold your money, they'll pay you for the privilege. Each year, you'll collect interest from the bank, and in most cases, the longer you agree to let them hold your money, the higher the interest rate you'll get. If you agree to keep your $1,000 with the bank for five years, you might collect something like 5% in interest payments per year. So the first year you collect $50 in interest on your $1,000 original deposit, and now you will have $1,050 in the bank at the beginning of year two. In year two, you collect another 5% interest on the new, higher total of $1,050, or $52.50 in interest, and so on through year five. After five years, your $1,000 will grow into $1,276. Not bad, and certainly a lot better than the mattress plan. Which brings us to plan C. This plan is known as, who needs the bank? There's an easy way to just skip the bank altogether and lend to businesses or to a group of individuals yourself. Often businesses borrow money directly by selling bonds. The corner bakery won't usually sell these, but larger, multi-million dollar, companies, such as McDonald's, do it all the time. If you purchase a $1,000 bond from a large company, for example, that company might agree to pay you 8% each year and pay back your original $1,000 after 10 years. That clearly beats the crummy 5% the bank was willing to pay you. There's one little problem, though, if you buy a bond from one of these companies and something goes wrong with its business, you may never get your interest or your money back. That's why riskier companies, say, Bob's House of Flapjacks and Pickles, usually have to pay higher interest rates than more solid established ones. That's why a company's bonds have to pay more than the bank. People need to make more money on their bond to make up for the risk that they may not receive the promised interest rate or their original money back. Of course, if you're not comfortable taking any risk of losing your $1,000, the US government sells bonds, too. While there is nothing completely riskless in this world, lending money to the US government is the closest any of us will ever get. If you are willing to lend the US government your money for 10 years, the government might, for example, agree to pay you something like 6% per year, if you lend for shorter periods of time, say, 5 years, the rate will usually be lower, maybe 4 or 5%. For our purposes, the bond we'll be looking at most is the US government bond that matures, pays off the original loan, after 10 years. We'll be looking at that one because 10 years is a long time. We'll want to compare how much we can earn from a safe bet like a US government bond with our other long-term investment choices. So if the annual interest rate on the 10-year government bond is 6%, that essentially means that people who are willing to lend their money out for 10 years, but are unwilling to take any risk of losing their original investment or of not receiving the promised interest rate, can still expect to receive 6% each year on their money. In other words, for people willing to lock their money up for 10 years, the no-risk rate of return is 6% per year. It's important to understand what that means. It means that if anyone asks you to loan them money or to invest with them over the long term, they better expect to pay you more than 6% a year. Why? 
because you can get 6% a year without taking any risk. All you have to do is lend money to the US government and they'll guarantee that you receive your 6% each and every year, along with all of your money back after 10 years. If Jason wants money for a share of his gum business, that investment better earn you more than 6% per year, or no way should you do it. If Jason wants to borrow money over the long term, same deal. He better expect to pay you a lot more than 6%. After all, you can get 6% risk-free by lending to the US government. And that's it. There are only a few things you need to remember from this chapter. Quick summary 1. You can stick your money under the mattress. But that plan kind of stinks. 2. You can put your money in the bank or buy bonds from the US government. You will be guaranteed an interest rate and your money back with no risk. Asterisk 3. You can buy bonds sold by companies or other groups. You will be promised higher interest rates than you could get by putting your money in the bank or by buying government bonds, but you could lose some or all of your money, so you better get paid enough for taking the risk. 4. You can do something else with your money. We'll talk about what in the next chapter. And I almost forgot, 5. Hot air rises. Hey, I did learn something from that balloon after all. Thanks, Johnson Smith. I'm going to make your life even simpler. As I write this, the 10-year US government bond rate is substantially lower than 6%. However, whenever the long-term government bond is paying less than 6%, we will still assume the rate is 6%. In other words, our other investment alternatives will, at a minimum, still have to beat 6%, no matter how low long-term US government bond interest rates go. The big picture is that we want to make sure we earn a lot more from our other investments than we could earn without taking any risk. Obviously, if long-term US government bond rates rose to 7% or higher, we would use 7% or that higher number. Now that's really it. Chapter 3 Okay. What else can you do with your money? Let's face it, putting money in the bank or lending it to the government is really boring. Hey, I know. Why don't we just go to the track and bet it all on a horse? Nah, I actually tried that, didn't work out too well. I even tried the dog races. That's where a bunch of greyhound dogs run around in a circle chasing a little mechanical rabbit. It's fun to watch, and you get to hang out with some really great people. Some of them even have teeth. You know what, though, on second thought, maybe that's not such a good idea, either. I kind of figured it wasn't for me after my dog actually caught the rabbit. My little guy got trampled by the other dogs on the first turn, got up, and started running the wrong way. Unfortunately, the mechanical rabbit zips around the track at about 60 miles an hour, and when my dog, the one I had placed my faith in and my money on, took a flying leap at the rabbit speeding toward him. Let's just say it wasn't pretty, all right, since you're probably concerned, the dog slammed into the 60 mile per hour rabbit at full speed, flew 30 feet in the air, and was tragically disqualified, which meant, alas, I had lost all of my money, dot asterisk in any case, now that we've explored. Most of the logical alternatives for your money, though I'm sure they race worms and various crustaceans someplace I haven't found yet. Let's look at one more. How about investing in a business? After all, Jason's going to grow up someday. Maybe he'll open up his own gum store. Better yet, maybe he'll open up a whole bunch of gum stores, usually referred to as a chain of stores, under some catchy name like Jason's Gum Shops. Let's assume that Jason personally trains all the salespeople in his unique brand of gum selling and that the chain is wildly successful. It could happen. Now Jason comes to you willing to sell half his business, he wants to buy a new pair of sunglasses, a real limousine, and maybe a house for himself and the lucky Mrs. Jason. Only now he's asking for big bucks, and we'll have to do some serious figuring before we can decide whether to take Jason up on his offer. It turns out that Jason's grown up quite a bit since the days when he scooted himself around town, and he now wants a hefty $6 million for half ownership of his business. Of course, $6 million bucks is more than most of us can afford, but, luckily, 
Jason isn't looking to sell half ownership of his business all to one person. In fact, Jason has decided to divide ownership of his business into a million equal pieces, or shares, as they're referred to on Wall Street. Jason's plan is to keep 500,000 shares for himself and sell his other 500,000 shares for $12 a piece, or $6 million in total. Anyone interested in buying part of Jason's business at that price can buy one share, for $12, 100 shares, for $1,200, 1,000 shares, for $12,000, or pretty much any number of shares they want. If you were to buy, for example, 10,000 shares costing $120,000, you would then own 1% of Jason's gum shops, 10,000 shares divided by the 1 million share total. That 1% doesn't mean that you would own the Spearmint Gum Department or a small piece of one of Jason's stores. Your 10,000 shares, or 1% ownership, of Jason's Gum Shops means that you would be entitled to 1% of the future earnings of the entire Jason's Gum Shops business. Now, of course, all you would have to do is figure out whether paying $120,000 for 1% of Jason's future gum profits is a good deal. This is where our analysis gets a little sticky, we have to be good gumshoes so we don't blow it and have our money chewed up and spit out. Anyway, you get the idea. Luckily, Jason has provided us with a lot of information. Since we already know that Jason wants $12 for each share in Jason's gum shops and that there are 1 million shares in total, this is referred to as 1 million shares outstanding, this means that Jason thinks his business is worth $12 million and therefore he thinks that 1% of his business is worth the $120,000 we just talked about. Well, that's all fine and dandy, but what matters here is what we think it's worth. So let's take a look at some of the other information Jason has given us. It seems that last year, Jason sold a total of $10 million worth of gum from the 10 stores in the highly successful Jason's Gum Shops chain. Of course, the $10 million is how much gum Jason's stores sold, but unfortunately, $10 million isn't how much profit Jason made. Obviously, Jason's stores ran up a few expenses along the way. Naturally, there was the cost of the gum that Jason sold, that totaled $6 million. That left him with $4 million in profits. But wait, we're far from finished. There was the rent Jason had to pay for the use of his 10 store locations. Then there were those pesky employees who for some reason expected to get paid for selling gum and keeping the stores clean and running smoothly. There were electricity and heating costs, trash removal, and accounting and all kinds of administrative costs. So Jason could keep track of all the money and gum flying all over the place, and that stuff adds up. In this case, another $2 million in expenses to be exact. That got Jason's business down to $2 million in profits. Jason's business had to pay taxes. The government needs money to provide services to its citizens, and profitable businesses must pay their share of taxes to keep it going. In the case of Jason's gum shops, that tax is equal to 40% of income, a fairly standard rate for many businesses. So 40% of the $2 million in profits that Jason's gum business earned last year had to go to the government in the form of taxes, since 40% of $2 million is $800,000, that left Jason's gum shops with a net profit of $1.2 million. Actually, Jason provided us with all that information about last year's income in a very neat table, known as an income statement, see Table 3.1. So there you have it. Jason's gum shops earned $1.2 million last year. Jason thinks that makes the business worth a total of $12 million. He is willing to sell us a piece of that business in any size up to half the entire business. At that $12 million valuation, i.e., $6 million for half, $1.2 million for a 10% stake, $120,000 for 1% ownership, and one share equaling one millionth of the business for a measly $12 should we do it? To keep it simple, let's take a look at what we'll be getting for each $12 share. Well, Jason has divided his business into 1 million equal shares. That means, if the whole business earned $1,200,000, each share earned one millionth of that amount. Since $1,200,000 divided by 1 million is $1.20, 
each $12 share was entitled to $1.20 in earnings. Is that a Jason's Gum Shop's annual income statement, for the last 12 months, total sales $10 million cost of goods sold, i.e., the gum, minus 6 million gross profit for million selling, general, and administrative expenses minus 2 million income before taxes 2 million taxes, at 40%. Minus 800,000 net income, $1,200,000 good deal. Let's look at it this way. If we invest $12 for a piece of Jason's business and it earns us $1.20 in the first year, our first year return on our investment would be $1.20 a $1.12, or 10% a 10% return in our first year. Pretty darn good, right? In Chapter 2, we discussed that, at the very least we had to beat the 6% annual return from a 10-year U.S. government bond. That's because buying those bonds would earn us 6% without having to take any risk. Since earning 10% is clearly more than earning 6%, ipso fatso, is it then true that paying $12 for a share that earns $1.20 a good deal? Well, life isn't quite that simple, but as we'll see in a later chapter, almost. The bottom line is, we're off to a great start, but we have to consider a few more things before we can make up our mind. First, $1.20 per share is what Jason's Gum Shops earned last year. We have to determine whether we think the business will earn that $1.20 in the coming year, or more than that, or maybe less. Last year's earnings may be a good starting point for estimating next year's earnings, but it may not. If Jason's Gum Shops doesn't earn $1.20 next year, the business won't be earning that 10% we expected on the $12 per share we just paid, it could be higher, but it could be lower. Second, once we come up with our estimate for how much Jason's business will earn next year, we have to determine how confident we are in our prediction. If we're taking a wild guess because we have no idea whether gum sales are steady from year to year, whether Jason's Gum Stores are just a fad, or whether new competition from other candy stores will affect Jason's profits, then our estimate may be suspect. But we have to be reasonable. If we're not sure whether earnings will be $1.50 or $2 per share, that kind of uncertainty is fine. Both of those numbers will represent that Jason's business is earning more than that 10% on our initial $12 per share cost. On the other hand, if we're uncertain whether the earnings will be $0.20 cents per share or $1.20, then our guaranteed 6% from the government bond may start to look a whole lot better. The third little detail we haven't yet considered is that next year is only one year. Even if Jason's Gum Shops earns $1.20 next year, or a lot more or a lot less, what about all the years after that? Will earnings keep growing every year? Maybe each store will keep selling more gum each year, and earnings will increase that way. Or maybe if 10 stores can make $1.20 per share, getting to 20 stores in a few years will cause earnings to grow to $2.40 per share or even higher. Of course, the gum business could always turn sour, sorry, in the next few years, causing gum earnings to remain stuck at levels well below $1.20 for a long time. And there's more. Okay, you're beginning to panic. I can feel it. This stuff is too hard. How are you going to figure it all out? How can anyone? And even if you take your best shot, am I expecting you, and my kids, for that matter, to gamble real money on a pile of guesses and estimates? And, oh yeah, aren't there tons of MBAs, PhDs, smart financial types, and professional investment analysts? not to mention full-time money managers, trying to figure out pretty much the same things? How can little old you compete with all those hard-working, smart, sophisticated guys? All right already, enough, calm down. Sheesh, can't I take you anywhere? Have a little faith. Hang in there. I'll do that summary thing, tell you what's important to remember, and we'll move on. Man, if I have to hold your hand for every little thing. 1. Buying a share in a business means you are purchasing a portion, or percentage interest, of that business. You are then entitled to a portion of that business's future earnings. 24. J-O-E-L-G-R-E-E-N-B-L-A-T-2. 
Figuring out what a business is worth involves estimating, okay, guessing, how much the business will earn in the future. 3. The earnings from your share of the profits must give you more money than you would receive by placing that same amount of money in a risk-free, 10-year US government bond. Remember, last chapter we set 6% as your absolute minimum annual return when government bond rates fall below 6%, and 4. No, I haven't forgotten about the magic formula. But you're going to have to stop bugging me about it, okay? Sheesh. Chapter 4. Great, figuring out what a business is worth isn't easy. After lots of guessing and estimating, maybe you get it right and maybe you get it wrong. But what if you could? What if you could figure out what a business was really worth? Is there something you could do with that information? Is there really a place like I promised in the first chapter, a place where you can buy a business for half its true value? A place where you can get $1,000 of value for only $500? You bet there is. But first, let's spend a few minutes in business school. For the past nine years, I have taught an investing course to a group of graduate business students at an Ivy League university. Needless to say, this is a pretty smart group of students. Each year, on the first day of class, I walk in and open the newspaper to the financial section. Found there are pages and pages of tables with lots of numbers in tiny print. Sounds great so far, right? Anyway, posted in these tables is a list of company names, and next to each name is a bunch of prices. Call out the name of a big, well-known company, I say. The students come up with companies like General Electric, IBM, General Motors, Abercrombie and Fitch. Actually, it doesn't really matter what companies the students shout out. My main point is so easy to make, any company name in almost any industry, large or small, well-known or not, will do. The result is always the same. I look in the paper next to General Electric and read off the numbers. It says here that the price for one share of General Electric was $35 yesterday. It also says here that the highest price that General Electric shares have sold for over the last year was $53 per share. The lowest price for a share over the last year was $29. For IBM, it's the same thing. You could have purchased one share of IBM yesterday for $85. Over the past year, shares of IBM have sold for as much as $93 and for as little as $55. General Motors sold for $37 per share yesterday. But over the last year, shares have sold for between $30 and $68. For Abercrombie and Fitch, which was selling for $27 per share yesterday, the range of prices per share over the last year has been between $15 per share at the lowest, and just over $33 per share for a high price. I then point out that that's a pretty wide range of prices for shares and a pretty short period of time for them to change so much. Looking at the price for shares over a two to three year period would give us an even wider range. So here's the question that I always ask, how can this be? These are big, well-known companies. Each of these companies has divided its ownership into millions, and sometimes billions, of equal shares, just like Jason did with his gum shops. Initially, companies sell their shares to the public, to both individuals and big institutional investors. After that, though, the people who buy these shares are free to sell them to anyone they want. Each day the newspaper lists the names of thousands of companies and the price at which people have been buying and selling an ownership share in each. The trading back and forth of these ownership shares takes place in a number of locations and over computer networks. These ownership shares are referred to as shares of stock, and collectively, this buying and selling activity is referred to as the stock market. A company as large as IBM or General Motors might have divided its ownership stake into something like a billion equal shares. That means that if at one point during the year you can purchase one share of General Motors for $30, and for our example we assume the ownership of General Motors has been divided into one billion equal pieces, or shares. Then the implied price to purchase the entire company, all 1 billion shares, would be $30 billion. However, if at some point during the same year, General Motors shares could have been purchased for $60 each, 
that would indicate that the cost to purchase all of General Motors would be $60 billion. So I ask the question again, how can this be? Can the value of General Motors, the largest car manufacturer in North America, change that much within the same year? Can a company that large be worth $30 billion one day and then a few months later be worth $60 billion? Are they selling twice as many cars, making twice as much money, or doing something drastically different in their business to justify such a large change in value? Of course, it's possible. But what about the big price changes in IBM, Abercrombie and & Fitch, and General Electric? Does something happen each and every year to account for large changes in the value of most companies? Remember, every year the results are the same. For pretty much any company that my students name, the range of high and low prices, over the course of only one year, is huge. Does this make sense? Well, to save the class time, and since my attention span is usually a matter of seconds, I usually blurt out the answer. No. It makes no sense that the values of most companies swing wildly from high to low, or low to high, during the course of each and every year. On the other hand, it seems pretty clear that the prices of the shares in most companies swing around wildly each and every year. All you have to do is look in the newspaper to see that that's true. So I ask my room full of smart, sophisticated students to try to explain why. Why do the prices of all these businesses move around so much each year if the values of their businesses can't possibly change that much? Well, it's a good question, so I generally let my students spend some time offering up complicated explanations and theories. In fact, it's such a good question that professors have developed whole fields of economic, mathematical, and social study to try to explain it. Even more incredible, most of this academic work has involved coming up with theories as to why something that clearly makes no sense, actually makes sense. You have to be really smart to do that. So why do share prices move around so much every year when it seems clear that the values of the underlying businesses do not? Well, here's how I explain it to my students, who knows and who cares? Maybe people go nuts a lot. Maybe it's hard to predict future earnings. Maybe it's hard to decide what a fair rate of return on your purchase price is. Maybe people get a little depressed sometimes and don't want to pay a lot for stuff. Maybe people get excited sometimes and are willing to pay a lot. So maybe people simply justify high prices by making high estimates for future earnings when they are happy and justify low prices by making low estimates when they are sad. But like I said, maybe people just go nuts a lot, still my favorite. The truth is that I don't really have to know why people are willing to buy and sell shares of most companies at wildly different prices over very short periods of time. I just have to know that they do. Why is this helpful? Let's think about that. Suppose you figured that a business, perhaps one like Jason's Gum Shops, was worth between $10 and $12 per share, and at varying times during the year, its shares could be purchased for between $6 and $11. Well, if you were confident about your estimate of what the business was worth, then deciding whether to buy shares when they were trading near $11 might be a difficult decision. But when shares in that same company during that same year were available at close to $6, your decision might well become much easier. At $6 per share, if your estimates of value were close to correct, then you would be buying shares in Jason's gum shops for only 50 or 60 cents on the dollar, for 50 or 60 percent of what they were truly worth. One of the greatest stock market writers and thinkers, Benjamin Graham, put it this way. Imagine that you are partners in the ownership of a business with a crazy guy named Mr. Market. Mr. Market is subject to wild mood swings. Each day he offers to buy your share of the business or sell you his share of the business at a particular price. Mr. Market always leaves the decision completely to you and every day you have three choices. You can sell your shares to Mr. Market at his stated price, you can buy Mr. Market's shares at that same price, or you can do nothing. Sometimes Mr. Market is in such a good mood that he names a price that is much higher than the true worth of the business. On those days, it would probably make sense for you to sell Mr. Market your share of the business. 
On other days, he is in such a poor mood that he names a very low price for the business. On those days, you might want to take advantage of Mr. Market's crazy offer to sell you shares at such a low price and to buy Mr. Market's share of the business. If the price named by Mr. Market is neither very high nor extraordinarily low relative to the value of the business, you might very logically choose to do nothing. In the world of the stock market, that's exactly how it works. The stock market is Mr. Market. If, according to the daily newspaper, General Motors is selling for $37 per share, you have three choices. You can buy shares in General Motors for $37 each, you can sell your shares in General Motors and receive $37 each, or you can do nothing. If you think GM is really worth $70 per share, then you might consider $37 a ridiculously low price and decide to buy some shares. If you think GM is really worth only $30 or $35 per share, and you happen to own some shares, you might decide to sell to Mr. Market at $37. If you think each share of General Motors is worth between $40 and $45 per share, you may decide to do nothing. At $37 per share, the price is not at a big enough discount for you to buy, nor is $37 a generous enough offer to make you want to sell. In short, you are never required to act. You alone can choose to act only when the price offered by Mr. Market appears very low, when you might decide to buy some shares, or extremely high, when you might consider selling any shares you own to Mr. Market. Graham referred to this practice of buying shares of a company only when they trade at a large discount to true value as investing with a margin of safety. The difference between your estimated value per share of, say, $70 and the purchase price of your shares of perhaps $37 would represent a margin of safety for your investment. If your original calculations of the value of shares in a company like General Motors were too high, or the car business unexpectedly took a turn for the worse after your purchase, the margin of safety in your original purchase price could still protect you from losing money. Even if you originally estimated fair value to be $70, and it turned out that $60 or even $50 was closer to the true value for each share, a purchase price of $37 would leave enough margin for you to still make money on your original investment. Graham figured that always using the margin of safety principle when deciding whether to purchase shares of a business from a crazy partner, like Mr. Market was the secret to making safe and reliable investment profits. In fact, these two concepts, requiring a margin of safety for your investment purchases and viewing the stock market as if it were a partner like Mr. Market, have been used with much success by some of the greatest investors of all time. But wait. There's still a problem here. Okay, maybe a few. First, as we discussed, how are you supposed to know what a business is worth? If you can't place a fair value on a company, then you can't divide that number by the number of shares that exist, and you can't figure out what the fair value of a share of stock is. So even if a share of General Motors sells for $30 on one day and $60 per share a few months later, you have no idea whether one of those prices is cheap and one is expensive or both are cheap or both expensive, or whatever. In short, from what we've learned so far, you wouldn't know a bargain price if it hit you in the head. Second, if you could figure out a fair price or price range for the business, how would you know whether you were right, or even close to right? Remember, in the process of figuring out the value of a business, all you do is make a bunch of guesses and estimates. Those estimates involve predicting earnings for a business for many years into the future. Even experts, whatever that means, have a tough time doing that. Third, as we already covered, aren't there tons of smart, hard-working people trying to figure out all this stuff, too? Aren't there lots of stock market analysts and professional investors who spend their time trying to figure out what companies are really worth? Even if I could really teach you how to invest, wouldn't these smart, knowledgeable, and experienced people be better at it than you? Wouldn't these people scoop up all of the obvious bargains before you got there? How can you compete with those guys? All you did was buy a book, a book that says even kids, okay, teenagers, can learn how to make big money in the stock market. Does that make sense? What chance do you really have? Well, a sane person might start to feel a little foolish about now. But you paid good money for this book. 
you could already be a few cards short of a full deck. So at least we've got that going for us. In any case, ready or not, here comes the summary. 1. Stock prices move around wildly over very short periods of time. This does not mean that the values of the underlying companies have changed very much during that same period. In effect, the stock market acts very much like a crazy guy named Mr. Market. 2. It is a good idea to buy shares of a company at a big discount to your estimated value of those shares. Buying shares at a large discount to value will provide you with a large margin of safety and lead to safe and consistently profitable investments. 3. From what we've learned so far, you wouldn't know a bargain price stock if it hit you in the head. 4. Being a few cards short of a full deck, you might as well keep reading. Chapter 5. I love movies, and The Karate Kid is one of my favorites. Of course, I would like any art form where eating popcorn and candy are part of the deal. But there is one scene in this particular movie that holds special meaning for me. In it, the old karate master, Mr. Miyagi, is supposed to be teaching his teenage apprentice, Daniel, how to fight. The boy is new at school and being bullied by a group of karate-trained toughs. Daniel hopes learning karate will help him stand up to his tormentors and win the girl of his dreams. But instead of teaching him karate, Mr. Miyagi puts Daniel to work, waxing cars, painting fences, and sanding floors. So after a whirlwind of scenes showing poor Daniel working his fingers to the bone, waxing, painting, and sanding, the youth has finally had enough. He confronts Mr. Miyagi and essentially says, Why am I wasting my time doing these simple and menial tasks when I should be learning karate? Mr. Miyagi has Daniel stand up from his sanding duties and starts throwing jabs at the young boy while yelling, Wax on! Wax off! Daniel deflects each jab with the swirling motions he learned from so many hours waxing cars. Next, Mr. Miyagi throws a punch while yelling, Paint the fence! Once again, Daniel deflects the punch, this time using the up and down action of painting a fence. Similarly, Mr. Miyagi's karate kick is then stopped by Daniel's expert floor sanding ability. In effect, by learning these few simple techniques, Daniel has unwittingly become a karate master. Now in good movies, the viewer participates in something called the willing suspension of disbelief. In other words, we kind of know that Ralph Macchio, the actor who plays Daniel in the movie, couldn't really use that waxing thing to defend himself in a dark alley. In the real world, before he could finish his first coat, Mr. Macchio would probably get smacked in the head and drop like a sack of potatoes. But while caught up in a movie, we're ready and more than willing to believe that Mr. Miyagi's simple methods can truly work wonders. Well, I'm going to have to ask you to do a little suspending of disbelief, too. Not because what you're going to learn doesn't make sense. On the contrary, the two concepts in this chapter are simple and obvious. It's just that these two concepts are so very basic, you'll have a hard time believing that such simple tools can turn you into a stock market master. But pay close attention now, and I promise you won't get a smack in the head later. When we last left Jason, the hero of our story, he had just asked us to chew over an exciting proposal. His proposal was simple, would we want to buy a piece of his wildly successful chain of gum stores, Jason's Gum Shops? You want some, you know you want some, but as much as Jason wanted to sell us a piece of his business, giving him an answer wasn't turning out to be so simple. By looking at the income statement that Jason had provided us, it turned out that Jason's chain of 10 gum shops had earned a total of $1.2 million last year, pretty impressive. Since Jason had divided his business into 1 million equal shares, we had concluded that each share was therefore entitled to $1.20 in earnings. $1,200,000 divided by 1 million shares. At Jason's asking price of $12 for each share, that meant that based on last year's earnings, Jason's gum shops would have given us a 10% return for each $12 share purchased. $1.20 divided by $12 equals 10%. That 10% return, calculated by dividing the earnings per share for the year by the share price, is known as the earnings yield. We then compared the earnings yield of 10% we could receive from an investment in Jason's business with the 6% return we 
could earn risk-free from investing in a 10-year U.S. government bond. We concluded, without too much trouble, that earning 10% per year on our investment was better than earning 6%. Of course, although that analysis was simple, we identified a bunch of problems. First, Jason's gum shops earned that $1.20 per share last year. Next year's earnings might turn out to be a completely different story. If Jason's business earned less than $1.20 next year, we wouldn't earn a 10% return on our investment and maybe we would be better off with a sure 6% from the government bond. Second, even if Jason's business did earn the $1.20 per share next year, or even more, that's only one year. How do we know, or how would we ever know, how much Jason's gum shops would earn in future years? It could be a lot more than $1.20 per share, but it could be a lot less, and our earnings yield could drop significantly below the 6% we could have earned risk-free from the US government. Lastly, even if we had an opinion about future earnings, how could we ever have any confidence that our predictions would turn out to be right? In short, all of our problems seem to boil down to this, it's hard to predict the future. If we can't predict the future earnings of a business, then it's hard to place a value on that business. If we can't value a business, then even if Mr. Market goes crazy sometimes and offers us unbelievable bargain prices, we won't recognize them. But rather than focusing on all the things that we don't know, let's go over a couple of the things that we do know. As we discussed, Jason's gum shops earned $1.20 per share last year. At a price of $12 per share, our earnings yield was therefore $1.20 divided by $12, or 10%. Easy enough. But what if Jason's gum shops earned $2.40 per share last year? What if we could still buy a share for $12? What would the earnings yield be then? Well, $2.40 divided by $12 equals 20%. Therefore, if Jason's gum shops had earned $2.40 per share last year, at a price of $12 per share, the earnings yield would be 20%. If Jason's gum shops had earned $3.60 per share last year, at a price of $12 per share, the earnings yield would be 30%. But it gets easier. Now follow closely because there are only two main points in this chapter and here comes the question that will determine whether you understand the first. All things being equal, if you could buy a share of Jason's gum shops for $12, which of those earnings results would you prefer? Would you prefer that Jason's gum shops had earned $1.20 per share last year, $2.40 per share last year? or $3.60 per share last year. In other words, would you prefer that the earnings yield calculated using last year's earnings was 10%, 20%, or 30%? Drum roll, please. If you answered that 30% is obviously better than 20% and 10%, you would be correct. And that's the point, you would rather have a higher earnings yield than a lower one. You would rather the business earn more relative to the price you are paying than less. Wax on. Now that wasn't so hard, but here comes the second point of the chapter, which focuses on something a bit different from the first, otherwise, I would be saying the same thing twice, which would be wasting your time, which is something I would never do unless I put it in parentheses. The first point related to price, how much we receive in earnings relative to our purchase price. In other words, is the purchase price a bargain or not? But beyond price, we might also want to know something about the nature of the business itself. In short, are we buying a good business or a bad business? Of course, there are plenty of ways we could define what makes a business either good or bad. Among other things, we could look at the quality of its products or services, the loyalty of its customers, the value of its brands, the efficiency of its operations, the talent of its management, the strength of its competitors, or the long-term prospects of its business. Obviously, any of these criteria, either alone or in combination, would be helpful in evaluating whether we were purchasing a good or a bad business. All of these assessments would also involve making guesses, estimates, and or predictions. As we already agreed, that's a pretty hard thing to do. So once again it might make sense to first examine some things that we already know. In fact, let's not make any predictions at all. 
Instead, let's just look at what happened last year. For instance, what if we found out that it cost Jason $400,000 to build each of his gum stores, including inventory, store displays, etc., and that each of those stores earned him $200,000 last year? That would mean, at least based on last year's results, that a typical store in the Jason's Gum Shops chain earns $200,000 each year, from an initial investment of only $400,000. This works out to a 50% yearly return, $200,000 divided by $400,000, on the initial cost of opening a gum store. This result is often referred to as a 50% return on capital. Without knowing much else, earning $200,000 each year from a store that costs $400,000 to build sounds like a pretty good business. But here comes the hard part, not really. What if Jason had a friend, Jimbo, who also owned a chain of stores. What if you had a chance to buy a piece of Jimbo's store chain, just broccoli? What if it also cost Jimbo $400,000 to open a new store? But what if each of those stores earned only $10,000 last year? Earning $10,000 a year from a store that costs you $400,000 to build works out to a one-year return of only 2.5% or a 2.5% return on capital. So here's the tough question, which business sounds better? Jason's Gum Shops, a business where each store earned $200,000 last year and cost $400,000 to build, or just Broccoli, a business where each store earned $10,000 last year but also cost $400,000 to build? In other words, which sounds better, a business that earns a 50% return on capital or one that earns a 2.5% return on capital? Of course, the answer is obvious, and that's the second point. You would rather own a business that earns a high return on capital than one that earns a low return on capital. Wax off, or paint the fence or sand something or whatever, asterisk, but here comes the big finish. Remember how I told you this chapter was going to be hard to believe? That by using just two simple tools you could actually become a stock market master. Well, believe it. You are a stock market master. How? Well, as you'll see next chapter, it turns out that if you just stick to buying good companies, ones that have a high return on capital, and to buying those companies only at bargain prices, at prices that give you a high earnings yield, you can end up systematically buying many of the good companies that crazy Mr. Market has decided to literally give away. You can achieve investment returns that beat the pants off even the best investment professionals including the smartest professional I know. You can beat the returns of top-notch professors and outperform every academic study ever done. In fact, you can more than double the annual returns of the stock market averages. But there's more. You can do it all by yourself. You can do it with low risk. You can do it without making any predictions. You can do it by following a simple formula that uses only the two basic concepts you just learned in this chapter. You can do it for the rest of your life, and you can choose to do it only after you are convinced that it really works. Hard to believe. Well, it's my job to prove it. Your job is to take the time to read and understand that the only reason this simple method actually works is that it makes perfect sense. But first, as always, here comes the summary, 1. Paying a bargain price when you purchase a share in a business is a good thing. One way to do this is to purchase a business that earns more relative to the price you are paying rather than less. In other words, a higher earnings yield is better than a lower one. 2. Buying a share of a good business is better than buying a share of a bad business. One way to do this is to purchase a business that can invest its own money at high rates of return rather than purchasing a business that can only invest at lower ones. In other words, businesses that earn a high return on capital are better than businesses that earn a low return on capital. 3. Combining points 1 and 2, buying good businesses at bargain prices is the secret to making lots of money. And most important, 4. Don't give money to guys named Jimbo. In fact, unless Jimbo expects those just broccoli stores to earn a lot more in the coming years, a presumption that would obviously involve making predictions about the future. It seems pretty clear that Jimbo's business is so bad he shouldn't even be building just broccoli stores. 
if he has a choice of building a new store for $400,000 that will earn him just 2.5% each year on his investment, or buying a U.S. government bond that will earn him 6% on his investment, risk-free. What's the point of even building a store in the first place? By opening just broccoli stores, Jimbo is actually throwing money away. Even though it looks like he is earning 2.5% on his investment in a new store, in reality he is throwing away the added 3.5% he could earn by simply buying a risk-free U.S. government bond. Chapter 6 So we're ready for the magic formula. Of course you're still probably thinking it won't work or it'll be too hard or there's something wrong with a book that even claims to have a magic formula. But if it makes you feel any better, even the great Benjamin Graham, one of the most respected and influential pioneers in the investment field, the man who introduced us to the concepts of Mr. Market and Margin of Safety, wrote about and used a magic formula of his own. Okay, so he didn't really call it that, apparently, the man had some dignity. But Graham felt that most individual investors, and even many professional investors, would have a hard time making the type of predictions and performing the level of analysis necessary to value, and invest in businesses on their own. Graham figured that by sharing a simple formula, one that made sense and had worked well in the past, individual investors would be able to achieve excellent investment results with a high degree of safety. Graham's formula involved purchasing companies whose stock prices were so low that the purchase price was actually lower than the proceeds that would be received from simply shutting down the business and selling off the company's assets in a fire sale. He called these stocks by various names, bargain issues, net current asset stocks, or stocks selling below their net liquidation value. Graham stated that it seems ridiculously simple to say that if one could buy a group of 20 or 30 companies that were cheap enough to meet the strict requirements of his formula, without doing any further analysis, the results should be quite satisfactory. In fact, Graham used this formula with much success for over 30 years. Unfortunately, the formula was designed during a period when many stocks were priced cheaply. For several decades after the stock market crash of 1929 and the Great Depression that followed, Investing in stocks was considered to be an extremely risky business. Investors, for the most part, were therefore unwilling to place a high value on stocks for fear of losing their money again. Although Graham's formula has continued to work over the years, especially during periods when stock prices are particularly depressed, in today's markets there are usually few, if any, stocks that meet the strict requirements of Graham's original formula. But that's okay. By using his formula successfully for so many years, Graham showed that a simple system for finding obviously cheap stocks could lead to safe and consistently good investment returns. If Mr. Market was willing to sell him a group of stocks at prices so low that they met his formula's strict requirements, Graham figured that on average he would end up owning a basket of bargains. Sure, the low prices of some of the stocks would be justified. Some companies deserve low prices because their future prospects are poor. But on average, Graham figured that the purchases made by using his formula would be bargains, bargains created by Mr. Market practically giving away businesses at unreasonably low prices. Graham suggested that by buying a group of these bargain stocks, investors could safely earn a high return without worrying about a few bad purchases, and without doing complicated analysis of individual stocks. Of course, that leaves us with an obvious challenge. Can we come up with a new formula, one that can beat the market averages with low risk? Can we find one that not only works in today's market but one that is flexible enough to work far into the future, regardless of the overall level of the market? Well, as you might have guessed, we can. In fact, you already know what it is. Last chapter we learned that, all things being equal, if we have the choice of buying a stock with a high earnings yield, one that earns a lot relative to the price we are paying, or buying one with a low earnings yield, one that earns very little relative to the price we are paying, we might as well choose the one with the high earnings yield. We also learned that, all things being equal, if the choice is between buying shares in a company that earns a high return on capital, a company whose stores or factories earn a lot relative to the cost to build them, and buying shares in a company that earns a low return on capital, a company whose stores or factories earn very little relative to the cost to build them, like just broccoli, 
we might as well choose the one with the high return on capital. So here it comes. What do you think would happen if we simply decided to buy shares in companies that had both a high earnings yield and a high return on capital? In other words, what would happen if we decided to only buy shares in good businesses, ones with high returns on capital, but only when they were available at bargain prices, priced to give us a high earnings yield? What would happen? Well, I'll tell you what would happen, we would make a lot of money. Or as Graham might put it, the profits would be quite satisfactory. K.E.T. 51, Orc in the Real World? Well, to answer that question, a logical first step might be to go back and see how a disciplined strategy of buying good businesses at bargain prices would have worked in the past. As it turns out, following a simple, common-sense investment strategy actually would have worked pretty well. Over the last 17 years, owning a portfolio of approximately 30 stocks that had the best combination of a high return on capital and a high earnings yield would have returned approximately 30.8% per year. Investing at that rate for 17 years, $11,000 would have turned into well over $1 million. Asterisk, of course, for some people, that might not seem like such a great return. On the other hand, those people are basically nuts. During those same 17 years, the overall market averaged a return of about 12.3% per year. At that rate, $11,000 would still have turned into an impressive $79,000. While that's certainly a lot, $1 million is more. And you could have made that $1 million while taking much less risk. The special database used for our magic formula study, Compustat's Point in Time database, contains data going back a total of 17 years. It contains the exact information known by Compustat customers at the time of each stock purchase. At a rate of 30.8% per year for 17 years. $11,000 would grow over 96 times to $1,056,000 before taxes and transaction costs than investing in the overall market. But we'll talk more about that later. For now, let's see just how the magic formula was put together. In that way, we can begin to understand why such a simple formula works and why it should continue to work far into the future. Later, we'll learn, in step-by-step -step fashion, how to apply the magic formula to find winning investments today. But keep in mind, the mechanics aren't the important part, the computer will be doing most of the work. As you read in chapter 1, it will be your belief in the overwhelming logic of the magic formula that will make the formula work for you in the long run. So let's try to understand how the magic formula chooses good companies at bargain prices. The formula starts with a list of the largest 3,500 companies available for trading on one of the major U.S. stock exchanges. Asterisk it then assigns a rank to those companies from 1 to 3,500 based on their return on capital. The company whose business had the highest return on capital would be assigned a rank of 1, and the company with the lowest return on capital, probably a company actually losing money, would receive a rank of 3,500. Similarly, the company that had the 232nd best return on capital would be assigned a rank of 232. Next, the formula follows the same procedure, but this time, the ranking is done using earnings yield. The company with the highest earnings yield is assigned a rank of 1, and the company with the lowest earnings yield receives a rank of 3,500. Likewise, the company with the 153rd highest earnings yield out of our list of 3,500 companies would be assigned a rank of 153. Finally, the formula just combines the rankings. The formula isn't looking for the company that ranks best on return on capital or the one with the highest earnings yield. Rather, the formula looks for the companies that have the best combination of those two factors. So, a company that ranked 232nd best in return on capital and 153rd highest in earnings yield would receive a combined ranking of 385, 232 plus 153. A company that ranked first in return on capital but only 1,150th best in earnings yield would receive a combined ranking of 1,151, 1,150 plus 1. Dot asterisk if you're not a numbers person, don't worry. 
Just keep in mind that the companies that receive the best combined rankings are the ones that have the best combination of both factors. In this system, the company that had the 232nd best return on capital could outrank the company that ranked first in return on capital. Why? Because we could purchase the company that had the asterisk the better combined ranking is, therefore, 385. 232nd best return on capital, an excellent ranking out of 3,500, for a price low enough to give us a very high earnings yield, 153rd cheapest out of 3,500 based on earnings yield. Getting excellent rankings in both categories, though not the top ranked in either, would be better under this ranking system than being the top ranked in one category with only a pretty good ranking in the other. Pretty simple, right? but it can't be this easy. Can a portfolio of 30 or so of the highest ranked stocks really get such great investment results? Well, consider this. Take a look at the returns that would have been achieved over the last 17 years if we had simply followed the recommendations of the magic formula, see table 6.1. Oops. This can't be. The results are just too good. Surely, something must be wrong here. We'll really have to examine these results very closely. But let's say we leave that for the next chapter. For now, we can review the short summary and spend some more time enjoying the results from using the magic formula. They appear to be quite satisfactory. Chapter 7 IT ain't the things we don't know that get us in trouble, said Artemis Ward, a 19th century newspaper columnist. It's the things we know that ain't so. And that, in a nutshell, is our problem. The magic formula looks like it works. In fact, the results are so good there can hardly be any argument. And of course, we want it to work. Who wouldn't want to make lots of money without trying all that hard? But does the magic formula really work? Sure, all the numbers look good, but do we know where they came from, or who they've been with, for that matter? More important, do we know where they're going? Even if the formula worked in the past, are we merely learning how to fight the last war? Will the formula continue to work in the future? Good questions, certainly. Before what we learned from last chapter gets us into too much trouble, let's see if we can find some good answers. First up, where did all those numbers come from? There's often a problem when looking back and making assumptions about what could have been accomplished in the past. While a computer stock-picking formula may appear to have generated spectacular theoretical returns, duplicating those results in the real world may be quite difficult. For instance, the magic formula may be picking companies that are so small that few people can really buy them. Often, small companies have very few shares available for purchase, and even a small amount of demand for those shares can push share prices higher. If that's the case, the formula may look great on paper, but in the real world, the fantastic results can't be replicated. That's why it's important that the companies chosen by the magic formula be pretty large. Last chapter, the magic formula ranked 3,500 of the largest companies available for trading on the major U.S. stock exchanges. The formula then chose its favorite stocks from that group. Even the very smallest of those 3,500 companies still had a market value, the number of shares times the stock price, of over $50 million dot with companies of that size, individual investors should be able to buy a reasonable number of shares without pushing prices higher. But let's see what happens when we raise the bar a little bit. It would certainly be nice if the magic formula worked for companies whether they were large or small. That way we could be more confident that the basic principle of buying good companies at bargain prices works for companies of any size. So instead of choosing from the largest 3,500 companies, let's look at just the largest 2,500 companies. The smallest companies in this group have a market value of at least $200 million. Over the last 17 years, ending in December 2004, the magic formula worked remarkably well for this group of larger companies, too. Owning a portfolio of 30 stocks chosen by the magic formula would have achieved an annual return of 23.7%. During the same period, 
the market's average return for this group was 12.4% per year. In other words, the magic formula practically doubled the market's average annual return. But what if we take it one step further? Let's look back and see what happened when we narrowed the group to just the largest 1,000 stocks, only the companies with market values over $1 billion. Even large institutional investors like mutual funds and large pension funds can buy these stocks. Once again, it appears that even the largest investors can practically double the market's compounded annual return simply by following the magic formula, but this can't be. There must be a catch. It just looks too darn easy. And of course, there may still be some problems. It's just that the problem of a magic formula that works only on paper but not in the real world isn't one of them. Okay. So, the companies chosen by the magic formula aren't too small for investors to buy. But how about this? Maybe the magic formula just got lucky with a few good stock picks and that's why the whole average looks so good. If the magic formula doesn't stay lucky, relying on past results could be very dangerous. Fortunately, it's very unlikely that luck was much of a factor at all. Throughout the 17 years of our study, we held a portfolio of roughly 30 stocks. Each stock selection was held for a period of one year. Asterisk in all, over 1,500 different stock picks were made for each of the tests, largest 3,500 stocks, largest 2,500 stocks, and largest 1,000 stocks. When we combine all of our tests, they are the results of over 4,500 separate magic formula selections. So it would be very difficult to argue that luck was a major factor. But there must be some other problem, right? Asterisk see the appendix section for more details. How about this? While it's pretty nice that the magic formula can find 30 good companies that Mr. Market has decided to throw away at bargain prices, what if it can't? What if those few bargain opportunities were to disappear for some reason? What if Mr. Market simply wised up a bit and stopped offering us those few incredible bargains? If that happened, we really would be out of luck. So let's try a little experiment. Starting with the largest 2,500 companies, what if we rank them again using the magic formula? In other words, what if we rank them from 1 to 2,500, from best to worst? Remember, the formula is looking for companies that have the best combination of a high return on capital and a high earnings yield. So the companies that appear to be in good businesses and available at bargain prices would be ranked closer to number one, while the companies losing lots of money that were offered at expensive prices would be ranked closer to 2,500. Now what if we divided those 2,500 companies into 10 equal groups based on their rankings? In other words, Group 1 would contain the 250 companies that the magic formula viewed as good companies at bargain prices. Group 2 would be the second highest ranked group of 250 companies. Group 3 would be the third highest ranked group, and so on. Group 10, therefore, would be a group of 250 stocks that the magic formula ranked as being poor companies at expensive prices. So what would happen if we did this every month for 17 years? What if we held each of those stock portfolios, each containing roughly 250 stocks, for one year and calculated the returns? Well, take a look, see table 7.2. Gee, that's interesting. The magic formula doesn't just work for only 30 stocks. The magic formula appears to work in order. The best ranked stocks perform the best and as the ranking drops, so do the returns. Group 1 beats Group 2, Group 2 beats Group 3, Group 3 beats Group 4, and so on, straight down the line from Group 1 to Group 10. Group 1, our best-ranked stocks, beats Group 10, our worst-ranked stocks, by over 15% a year. That's pretty amazing. In fact, it appears as though the magic formula can predict the future. If we know how a group of companies is ranked by the magic formula, we have a pretty good idea of how well that group will perform on average as an investment in the future. That also means that if we can't, for some reason, buy the top 30 stocks as ranked by the magic formula, it's no big deal. Buying the next 30 should work pretty well also. 
so should the next 30. In fact, the whole group of top-ranked stocks appears to do well. That may also solve one of our other potential problems. Remember how Ben Graham had his own magic formula? Buying a group of stocks that could meet the strict requirements of Graham's formula was a great way to make money. Unfortunately, in today's market, few, if any, companies qualify for purchase under Graham's original formula. That means Graham's formula isn't as useful as it once was. Fortunately, our magic formula doesn't seem to have that problem. It is merely a ranking formula. By definition, there always have to be stocks that rank at the top. Not only that, because the formula appears to work in order, we're not limited to just the top 30 stocks. Since the entire group of top-ranked stocks does well, there should always be plenty of high-performing stocks to choose from. For those of you keeping score on the sidelines, it's looking pretty good for the magic formula. Come on. That ranking stocks in order thing, man, that's pretty scary. It's been nice arguing back and forth about whether the magic formula really works, but the winner of that battle is pretty obvious. Maybe we should just stop the fight right now before somebody gets hurt? Alas. Not so fast. Sure, the evidence is pretty convincing. But all that means is that the magic formula has worked in the past. How do we know the magic formula will continue to work in the future? After all, with me being such a blabbermouth, why won't everyone start using it? Won't that ruin everything? Well, after we look at the summary, let's see. 1. The magic formula works for companies both large and small. 2. The magic formula was extensively tested. The great returns do not appear to be a matter of luck. 3. The magic formula ranks stocks in order. As a result, there should always be plenty of highly ranked stocks to choose from. The magic formula has been an incredibly accurate indicator of how a group of stocks will perform in the future. For next chapter, we'll have to discuss whether the magic formula can continue to get such great results. That would be nice. Chapter 8. I admit it. My knowledge of history is a little fuzzy. Asterisk, I guess I should have listened better in class. But there's one part of our history that has always baffled me. I never really understood how we won the Revolutionary War. Here we were, these 13 little colonies, up against the strongest country in the world. England had the best navy, the mightiest army, the most money and yet our scrappy little ragtag group of soldiers pulled out a victory. How'd that happen? Well, I have a theory. Given my limited knowledge, I don't know whether my theory has been asterisk though my knowledge of Bob Newhart's old comedy routines is quite good. Extensively studied. But the way I see it, we won because we were fighting a bunch of complete idiots. After all, the British strategy left a lot to be desired. On one side, you had British soldiers standing in plain sight, perfectly lined up, wearing, of all things, bright red coats, while shooting in unison. I'm sure it looked quite nice. On the other side, you had our guys, a messy, disorganized hodgepodge of soldiers, hiding behind rocks and trees, shooting back at a bunch of conveniently arranged bright red targets. No wonder we won. But here's the part one don't get. I can't imagine this was the first time the British fought like that. In other words, despite what I think, the British way of fighting must have actually worked in the past. My only question is, how? For all I know, they've been doing it that way for hundreds of years and apparently, whether it makes sense to me or not, with a great deal of success. Yet following the same game plan that had worked so well in the past clearly wasn't a good strategy going forward the British found that out the hard way. So what about us? We're about to march off, armed with what looks like a great game plan. We have a magic formula that makes sense and has produced phenomenal results in the past. We expect to have a lot of success with it in the future. But before we all line up to collect our money, we better stop and think about one obvious problem. How can our strategy keep working after everyone knows about it? If we can't find a good answer, like the British, we may end up as just another easy target. 
Well, first, here's some really good news. As it turns out, there are plenty of times when the magic formula doesn't work at all. Isn't that great? In fact, on average, in five months out of each year, the magic formula portfolio does worse than the overall market. But forget months. Often, the magic formula doesn't work for a full year or even more. That's even better. Imagine buying a book that tells you to invest real money in a group of stocks whose names were spit out by a computer. Imagine diligently watching those stocks each day as they do worse than the market averages over the course of many months or even years. Now imagine deciding enough is enough. No more trusting that stupid book or that mindless computer. You're going to roll up your sleeves and investigate the companies you purchased and the outlook for the businesses you actually own. As we'll find out later, imagine the horror when you realize that if you had only investigated these companies for a few minutes before buying your shares, there is no way you would have touched many of them. Finally, despite awful performance and the disagreeable prospects of the stocks that you own, imagine vowing to continue following the advice of that stupid book and that mindless computer. But why even worry about all this? After all, the magic formula works. We proved it last chapter. We're going to do really well, so there's no need to worry about months or years of poor performance. And though that sounds right, unfortunately, looking at the statistics for only our very successful 17-year test period, it turns out there's actually plenty to worry about. The magic formula portfolio fared poorly relative to the market averages in 5 out of every 12 months tested. For full year periods, the magic formula failed to beat the market averages once every 4 years. Asterisk for 1 out of every 6 periods tested. The magic formula did poorly for more than 2 years in a row. During those wonderful 17 years for the magic formula, there were even some periods when the formula did worse than the overall market for 3 years in a row. Think it's easy to stick with a formula that hasn't worked for several years? Do you think the typical reaction goes something like, I know this hasn't worked for a long time, or, I know I just lost a lot of money, but, let's keep doing what we're doing? I assure you, it is not. As a professional manager, if you do poorly while everyone else is doing well, you run the risk of losing all your clients and possibly your job. Many managers feel the only way to avoid that risk is to invest pretty much the way everyone else does. Often this means owning the most popular companies, usually the ones whose prospects look most promising over the next few quarters or the next year or two. Perhaps now you're beginning to see why most everyone else won't be using the magic formula. Though some may take it out for a spin, most won't last past the first few months or years of poor performance. As we discussed back in Chapter 1, you're also beginning to see why all that having to believe stuff is so important. If you don't believe that the magic formula will work for you, you'll most likely quit before it has a chance to work. At least, that's where the statistics over the last 17 years seem to point. The magic formula works, long-term annual returns of double, or in some cases almost triple, the returns of the market averages. Only those good returns can get pretty lumpy. Over shorter periods, it may work or it may not. When it comes to the magic formula, shorter periods can often mean years, not days or months. In a strange but logical way, that's the good news. Good news, that is, if you believe enough in the magic formula to stick with it over the long term. But to truly stick with a strategy that hasn't worked in years and years, you're going to have to really believe in it deep down in your bones. Sure, the spectacular track record of the magic formula will help, but let's see what your bones think of the next chapter. Chapter 9 Vomit under the 3M, spaces and run. Now there's a saying you don't hear every day. The main reason you don't hear it much is pretty straightforward. Over time, the phrase has lost all of its meaning. In fact, I really only needed it to pass my 8th grade course in print shop. You see, old-time printers used to set type by hand and actually pick letters individually out of a box. To pass the course, my fellow middle schoolers and I were forced to memorize the location of these letters. The letters in the bottom row were VUT, then something called a 3M space, followed by the letters AR. 
we remembered the order by the catchy phrase, vomit under the three M's paces and run. With the advent of computers, my little memory device, and print shop, for that matter, is now useless. Of course, the world has changed a lot since I was in middle school. No one teaches print shop anymore. Thankfully, though, some subjects haven't changed. Math class, for one, is still pretty much the same. As investors, that's really important to know. That's because, in order for the magic formula to make us money in the long run, the principles behind it must appear not only sensible and logical, but timeless. Otherwise, there is no way we'll be able to hang on when our short-term results turn against us. As simple as it may seem, knowing that 2 plus 2 always equals 4 can be a pretty powerful concept. No matter how many people tell us differently, no matter how long they tell us, and no matter how smart all those people appear to be, we are unlikely to waver in our conviction. In a similar way, our level of confidence in the magic formula will determine whether we can hang on to a strategy that may be both unpopular and unsuccessful for seemingly long periods of time. So what is it about the magic formula that makes sense, so much sense, in fact, that we won't waver when things turn against us? Well, let's take another look. The magic formula chooses companies through a ranking system. Those companies that have both a high return on capital and a high earnings yield are the ones that the formula ranks as best. Put more simply, the formula is systematically helping us find above-average companies that we can buy at below-average prices. That certainly sounds logical and sensible. If, indeed, that's what we're really doing, it also sounds like a strategy we can truly believe in. So, let's go step by step and see whether that's true. First, why are companies that earn a high return on capital so special? What kind of companies is our formula telling us to buy? What makes them above average? To understand the answers to those questions, let's go back and check in with our old friend Jason. Last year, as you may remember, was a pretty good year for Jason's business. Each of his gum shops earned $200,000. Since he only had to invest $400,000 to build each store, including inventory, store displays, etc., that meant that his return on capital for opening a gum shop was a pretty impressive 50%. $200,000 divided by $400,000. So what does that mean? Most people and most businesses can't find an investment that will earn a 50% annual return. If the past year is a good guideline and Jason's company can really earn 50% a year on its money by simply opening another store, that makes Jason's gum shops a pretty special business. Think about that. Having the opportunity to invest your money and earn 50% per year is pretty rare. While it's true that there is no guarantee that Jason's new stores, or his old stores, will continue to earn 50% returns each year on their original cost, last year's high returns may be a good indicator of the opportunity to earn high returns from investing in that same business going forward. If that's true and Jason's gum shops can continue to earn high returns from its investments in old and new stores, that's really good news for Jason. First, that may mean that the profits from Jason's business don't have to just sit there. While Jason's gum shops could take those earnings and invest in a government bond paying 6% per year, they have a much better option. The company can take those earnings and invest them in a new store. So not only will the original investment in the first store continue to earn 50% per year, but Jason's Gum Shops has the chance to invest the profits from the first store in a new store that may also earn 50% a year. For example, if Jason's Gum Shops earned $200,000 last year, Jason has a few options. He can distribute that money to the shareholders of the business, the shareholders can then invest that money however they choose. If the business doesn't change much this coming year, Jason's Gum Shops will earn $200,000 again. That may be a fine outcome. But if, instead, Jason's Gum Shops takes its $200,000 in profits and invests them in government bonds paying 6%, 3.6% after taxes at a 40% rate, Jason's business will earn $207,200 this coming year, $200,000 from the store and $7,200 in after-tax profits from interest on the bond. 
though earnings would be higher than last year, the growth rate in earnings would not be very high. But here's where the big bucks roll in. If Jason takes that same $200,000 in profits, and can invest it in a new store that earns a 50% annual return, asterisk the earnings for Jason's gum shops will grow to $300,000 in the coming year, $200,000 from the original store and an additional $100,000 from the investment in the new store, going from $200,000 in earnings last year, to $300,000 in the coming year would represent a 50% earnings growth rate in one year. In other words, Owning a business that has the opportunity to invest some, or all of its profits at a very high rate of return can contribute to a very high rate of earnings growth. Asterisk assume for this example that we can invest in half a store, though a new store costs $400,000. So now we know two important things about businesses that can earn a high return on capital. First, Businesses that can earn a high return on capital may also have the opportunity to invest their profits at very high rates of return. Since most people and businesses can invest their money at only average rates of return, this opportunity is something special. Second, as we just learned, the ability to earn a high return on capital may also contribute to a high rate of earnings growth. Certainly, that's good news for the companies chosen by the magic formula. But that still leaves us with one obvious question. If a business like Jason's really can make 50% a year by opening a gum shop, why won't other people see that and start opening their own gum shops? That would mean more competition for Jason's gum shops. More competition could mean that Jason will sell less gum in each of his stores. More competition could mean that Jason must lower his prices to attract business. More competition could mean that someone builds a better gum shop. In short, more competition could mean lower profits going forward for Jason's gum shops. In fact, that's how our system of capitalism works. Good businesses attract competition. Even if competing gum shops open up and the return on capital from opening a new Jason's gum store drops to 40%, the threat to future profits might not end there. Earning 40% annual returns from opening a gum shop is still quite good. People might see those 40% annual returns from opening a gum shop as very attractive and decide to open their own gum shops. Then, due to the increased competition, returns may fall all the way to 30% per year from building a new gum shop. But even there it might not stop. Earning 30% a year on an investment is also good. More competition could continue to drive down future returns on capital from new stores and from old stores that are already built. This whole capitalism thing could result in profits continuing to spiral downward, until the annual returns on capital from owning gum stores isn't so great anymore. Some system. But here's the thing. If capitalism is such a tough system, how does the magic formula find us companies that are able to earn a high return on capital in the first place? To earn a high return on capital even for one year, it's likely that, at least temporarily, there's something special about that company's business. Otherwise, competition would already have driven down returns on capital to lower levels. It could be that the company has a relatively new business concept, perhaps a candy store that sells only gum, or a new product like a hot video game, or a better product, such as an iPod that's smaller and easier to use than competitors' products, a good brand name, people will happily pay more for Coke than for Joe's Cola, so Coke can charge more than Joe's and continue to earn a high return on capital despite having competition, or a company could have a very strong competitive position. eBay was one of the first auction websites and has more buyers and sellers than anyone else, so it's hard for new auction sites to offer the same benefits to customers. In short, companies that achieve a high return on capital are likely to have a special advantage of some kind. That special advantage keeps competitors from destroying the ability to earn above-average profits. Businesses that don't have anything special going for them, such as new or better products, well-known brand names, or strong competitive positions, are likely to earn only average or below-average returns on capital. If there's nothing special about a company's business, then it's easy for someone to come in and start a competing business. If a business is earning a high return on capital and it's easy to compete, eventually someone will. 
they'll keep competing until returns on capital are driven down to average levels. But the magic formula doesn't choose companies with average returns on capital. It doesn't choose companies with below average returns on capital either. Businesses like Just Broccoli are unlikely to earn a high return on capital for even one year. So by eliminating companies that earn ordinary or poor returns on capital, the magic formula starts with a group of companies that have a high return on capital. Sure, some of the companies chosen by the magic formula won't be able to maintain their high return on capital. As we just learned, businesses with high returns on capital tend to attract competition. Also, even mediocre businesses can have a good year or two and temporarily achieve a high return on capital. But, on average, the high return on capital companies chosen by the magic formula are more likely to have the opportunity to reinvest a portion of their profits at high rates of return. They are more likely to have the ability to achieve high rates of earnings growth. They are also more likely to have some special competitive advantage that will allow them to continue to earn an above average return on capital. In other words, on average, the magic formula is finding us good companies. And what does the magic formula do with this group of good companies? The formula chooses only good companies that also have a high earnings yield. A high earnings yield means that the formula will buy only those companies that earn a lot compared to the price we are paying. Hum, buying above average companies at below average prices, it sounds like it should work. But how do your bones feel about that? Chapter 10 Love Sailing I'm not very good at sailing. I know this, not just from the fact that my wife and kids are scared to go with me, but from hard experience. Once, through a slight miscalculation of wind and water speed, I was 20 feet away from being slammed by a barge at least three football fields long. I remember this quite well, because I had my wife as a passenger, who hates boats anyway, while I was busy pulling the starter cord on my little five-horsepower outboard engine, darn thing never works when you really need it, as the giant barge blasted its horn for me to get out of the way. Usually sailboats have the right of way over motorboats, but since nine billion pound barges don't steer all that quickly, the right of way thing gets switched around, good to keep in mind if it ever comes up. So there I was, repeatedly pulling the worthless starter cord while trying to act like I had everything under control, just so my wife's last words wouldn't be, I hate this stupid boat, when a final puff of wind helped us sail out of danger. I'm recounting this story not because I enjoy sailing alone. I actually like having company, preferably brave or blind company. I'm telling you this because even though I'm clearly not a good sailor, I still love sailing. And that's the same way many people feel about investing in the stock market. They may not be particularly good at it, or they may not know whether they are any good at it, but there's something about the process or the experience that they enjoy. For some of these people, investing by using a magic formula may take away some of that fun. I understand this. There are also people who are good or would be good at picking individual stocks without using a magic formula. And that's fine, too. The next chapter should give both groups an idea of what they'll need to know if they want to be successful at picking stocks on their own. It should also show them how the principles behind the magic formula can still be used to guide individual investment decisions. But before even thinking about whether to go forward investing with or without the magic formula, there are still a few more things you should know. First, the magic formula has a better track record than I've been letting on. I didn't reveal this good news earlier for a reason. A good track record is not why you should want to follow the magic formula. A good track record is not why you will have good results in the future. A good track record is not why you will keep following the magic formula even when results turn against you. The truth is that a good track record only helps once you understand why the track record is so good. Now that you do, simply put, the magic formula makes perfect sense. I can trust you not to get carried away with a little more good news. As you recall, the magic formula was tested over a recent 17-year period. A portfolio of approximately 30 stocks selected by the magic formula was held throughout that time, with each individual stock selection held for a period of one year. Performance was then measured over 193 separate one-year periods. 
As we discussed, over one-year periods, the magic formula stock portfolios underperformed the market averages in one out of every four years tested. Following the formula for any two-year period in a row, starting with any month during the 17 years, the magic formula underperformed the market averages in one out of every six periods tested. Remember, while that may not sound all that bad, underperforming for two years in a row is actually pretty hard to take. But here comes the good news. Following the formula for any three-year period in a row, the magic formula beat the market averages 95% of the time. 160 out of 169 three-year periods tested, asterisk but that's not all. Over three-year periods, if you followed the magic formula, you would never have lost money. That's right. Sticking with the magic formula for any three-year period during those 17 years, you would have made money 100% of the time. 169 out of 169 asterisk there are fewer three-year periods tested than one-year periods because the last three-year period that could be tested started in January 2002 and ended December 31, 2004. The last one-year period started in January 2004, three-year periods, dot asterisk of the 169 separate three-year periods tested. The worst return for the magic formula was a gain of 11%. The worst return over a three-year period for the market averages was a loss of 46%. That's a pretty big difference. But that's still not all. All those numbers you just read about were based on the results achieved by choosing from only the largest 1,000 stocks, those with a market value over $1 billion. The results from choosing from the largest 3,500 stocks, market values over $50 million, a group of stocks individual investors can generally buy, were even better. Every three-year period tested, 169 of 169, was positive for the magic formula portfolios, and every three-year period beat the market averages, 169 out of 169. That's right. The magic formula beat the market averages in every single period. Hey, maybe there is something to this magic formula, after all, but can we really expect such great results without taking much risk? Well, the answer often depends on how you choose to look at risk. Although over the last 50 asterisk in other words, during our 17-year test period, the magic formula portfolios were still profitable even when they didn't beat the market. With this group of 3,500 companies, the worst three-year return for the magic formula portfolios was a gain of 35%. For the market averages, the worst three-year return was a loss of 45%. Though, in this case, the magic formula looks pretty darn good no matter how we choose to measure risk. Years professors in the financial field have come up with interesting ways to measure or compare the risks of different investment strategies. Most of these involve measuring risk in a way that should have no meaning to you. This is true especially if you choose to invest with a truly long-term time horizon. When thinking about risk, rather than making things unnecessarily complicated, there are really two main things you should want to know about an investment strategy. 1. What is the risk of losing money following that strategy over the long term? 2. What is the risk that your chosen strategy will perform worse than alternative strategies over the long term? So how does the magic formula stack up under this definition of risk? Since it is fairly easy to design an investment strategy to equal the return of the market averages asterisk, and yet, as we'll discuss later, most professional investors do even worse than the market averages, we can, at the very least, make a reasonable comparison of these two simple strategies. So let's see. During our test period and using even a relatively short three-year time frame, the magic formula strategy asterisk such as an investment in an index fund or an exchange-traded fund, ETF, did pretty darn well. The returns from the magic formula strategy were far superior to the returns of the market averages. The magic formula strategy never lost money. Asterisk the magic formula strategy beat the market averages over almost every single three year period tested. In short, the magic formula strategy achieved better results with less risk than the market averages. Though sticking with the magic formula strategy for even three years paid off incredibly well during our test period. This may not always be the case. 
even superior investment strategies may take a long time to show their stuff. If an investment strategy truly makes sense, the longer the time horizon you maintain, the better your chances for ultimate success. Time horizons of 5, 10, or even 20 years are ideal. Though not easy to do, even maintaining a 3 to 5 year horizon for your stock market investment should give you a large advantage over most investors. It is also the minimum time frame for any meaningful comparison of the risks and results of alternative investment strategies. We now have a better understanding of just how powerful and low risk the magic formula truly is, but we still asterisk the market averages lost money in 12% of the three year periods tested. Of course, despite the 100% success rate of the magic formula during the test period, it is almost certain that the magic formula strategy will have negative performance periods in the future. Have one problem left to solve before we can move on to the next chapter. It has to do with our old friend Mr. Market, and maintaining a proper time horizon plays a key role here, too. As you may recall from the first day of business school in Chapter 4, it is Mr. Market's constantly changing emotional state that creates the bargain opportunities that the magic formula is able to put to its advantage. But these same emotions create a problem. If Mr. Market is so unstable, how can we be sure that he will eventually pay a fair price for our bargain purchases? If we don't eventually get a fair price from Mr. Market, a bargain could remain a bargain forever, or worse, become even more of a bargain. So here's the other thing you need to know about Mr. Market, over the short term, Mr. Market acts like a wildly emotional guy who can buy or sell stocks at depressed or inflated prices. Over the long run, it's a completely different story, Mr. Market gets it right. Yep. Over the long term, Crazy Mr. Market is actually a very rational fellow. It may take a few weeks or a few months, and not infrequently a few years, but eventually Mr. Market will pay a fair price for our shares. I actually give a guarantee to my MBA students at the beginning of each semester. I guarantee them that if they do a good job valuing a company, Mr. Market will eventually agree with them. I tell them that, though it can occasionally take longer, if their analysis is correct, Two to three years is usually all the time they'll have to wait for Mr. Market to reward their bargain purchases with a fair price. How can this be? Isn't Mr. Market an emotional basket case? Well, although it's true that Mr. Market can often be ruled by emotion over the short term, over time facts and reality take over. If the price of a stock has been beaten down unfairly in the short term by an overly emotional Mr. Market, this could happen. For instance, when a company announces some bad news or is expected to receive some bad news in the near future, a few things can take place. First, there are a lot of smart people out there. If the price offered by Mr. Market is truly a bargain, some of these smart people will eventually recognize the bargain opportunity, buy stock, and push the price closer to fair value. This doesn't have to happen right away. Sometimes uncertainty about the prospects for a particular company over the near term will keep potential buyers away. Sometimes the influence of emotions can last for years. But here's the thing. Eventually, the problem or the reason for the emotional reaction is resolved. It could be a positive resolution or a negative one. It doesn't really matter. If there is uncertainty about a company's earnings over the next two or three years, by waiting long enough we eventually find out the answer, even if this takes the full two or three years. Once the reality of the situation is known, smart investors will buy stock if the bargain opportunity still exists. Second, even if these so-called smart people don't recognize the bargain opportunity and buy shares, there are other ways that stock prices can move toward fair value. Often companies buy back their own shares. If a company believes its shares are undervalued, the management of the company can decide that it is a good investment to use its own cash and repurchase some of the company's shares. Asterisk. So this action of companies buying back their own shares is another activity that causes prices to rise and may help eliminate some bargain opportunities. If that doesn't work, there are still other ways that share prices tend to move toward fair value. Remember, a share of stock represents an ownership interest in an actual company. Anyone who buys all of the shares asterisk this would reduce the amount of cash the company had, 
but it would also reduce the number of shares outstanding of the company. If ownership of the company is distributed among fewer shares, each remaining shareholder would own a larger percentage interest in the company. Outstanding would then own the entire company. Often, if a bargain opportunity persists for too long, another company or a large investment firm may decide to make a bid for all of the shares outstanding and purchase the entire company. Sometimes even the possibility that a buyer for the whole company may emerge can cause share prices to rise toward fair value. In short, over time the interaction of all of these things, smart investors searching for bargain opportunities, companies buying back their own shares, and the takeover or possibility of a takeover of an entire company, work together to move share prices toward fair value. Sometimes this process works quickly, and sometimes it can take several years. Although over the short term, Mr. Market may set stock prices based on emotion, over the long term, it is the value of the company that becomes most important to Mr. Market. This means that if you buy shares at what you believe to be a bargain price and you are right, Mr. Market will eventually agree and offer to buy those shares at a fair price. In other words, bargain purchases will be rewarded. Though the process doesn't always work quickly, two to three years is usually enough time for Mr. Market to get things right. So now that we have all that good news out of the way, let's see if we can sail through the next chapter without hitting anything. And there you have it, folks, the insights, the wisdom, and the magic within the little book that still beats the market. I hope you enjoyed our journey through this financial gem. Before we wrap up, I want to hear from you. Have you read this book, or are you planning to? Share your thoughts in the comments below. Let's create a discussion and learn from each other. Thank you for spending this time with me. Now, go ahead, grab a copy of The Little Book That Still Beats the Market, and let's keep exploring the fascinating world of books and finance together. Until next time, happy reading and smart investing.